fits. Oops, let me fix this. Continuing our study in the Minor Prophets um, and continuing our study in Hosea. We began last week uh, with an overview, a brief introduction, an overview to the book of Hosea, and, um, and then spent our time walking through the first three chapters, um, kind of digging into the, the, the texture of, those, of, of that part of the book. What I'd like to do tonight is do just a very brief uh, review of what we looked at uh, last week and then get into the second section, which is chapters 4 through 14. And there we'll, we'll kind of look at that a um, little bit more of a kind of jogging tour, so to speak. Zoom in on some sections and then just see some, some of the key elements. And then we'll step back and, and consider a few um, so what take-home questions. Um, let's begin in prayer. Father, I ask that you would um, be with us tonight as we turn to your scriptures, that you would um, help us to have understanding uh, of Hosea, uh, the, the, the book, um, but, but even more, uh, may the truths that Hosea reveals um, be imprinted and written um, on our hearts um, in, a, in a way that would endure and deepen. Um, help us to know you and to... Uh, be transformed into your image. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, um, so again, just a brief review of what we looked at. Let's see if this is coming up. Okay. I don't, know if I have, I don't think I have that screen. Okay. There we go. Okay, I can see now what you can see. All right. Um, so just, again, quick background sketch. Hosea uh, is, a, is a prophet of God that spoke to the northern kingdom of Israel, and he did so in the final years leading up to the destruction of Samaria, the, the end of the northern kingdom of Israel as we know it, and their exile, uh, their scattering into Assyria. And a little over a hundred years before the southern kingdom would go into exile, captivity in Babylon. Um, prophesied a little bit after Amos, prophesied around the same time that Isaiah and Micah is a prophet to the southern kingdom in Judah. Um, if you remember last week, we talked about the basic layout of Hosea. Again, it's helpful to get our bearings on the book to see a little bit about the book's design, to see how, how it flows from subject to subject. It begins and ends with a single introductory and concluding verse. The introduction tells us a little bit about Hosea and when he prophesied. The conclusion in 14 verse 9 is a call to wisdom. And then in between you have uh, the body of the, the book where the first three chapters uh, tell the story of Hosea's marriage to, the, to Gomer, a wife of harlotry, and her unfaithfulness, and, and that story of Hosea's marriage to a harlot uh, parallels God's marriage to Israel, God's relationship with Israel, and their adultery, and their whoring after other, other gods. That spiritual prostitution manifests itself in a, in a couple ways. The most predominant and the most pronounced is definitely their idolatry. Um, Hosea will, will condemn the Baals, the Ashtoreth, the, the Canaanite gods that they would go after in their idolatrous practices and devotions and, and, and all that. Uh, another layer of that, though, is uh, we talked about this a little bit last week, but they're, they're unholy alliances with other nations. Um, and that's wrong on a couple levels. One is they're putting their trust in something that's not God. Two, it's an unholy mixing uh, uh, and a compromise that would take place through those alliances and those allegiances. And so you see that as just this, God describes it as adultery, as prostitution, as whoring. Um, and then that, so that, that really gets us into the book in chapters 1 through 3. And then 4 through 14, we, we sort of step back and, and just see various series of um, judgments, which would be these accusations and then the sentence that God would pronounce. Okay? And so we, we broke that down a little bit more and, and noticed a pattern from judgment to restoration, judgment to restoration, and, and where the predominant force of Hosea is these indictments for sin, warnings of judgment, he weaves in these bright 
punctures of, of, of hope <clears throat> throughout the book. All right, so let's, let's go ahead and, and dig in. So again, we looked at one through three last week. Let's pick up in chapter four and um, start working through that. So Hosea chapter four, um, beginning in verse one. I'm going to just grab a drink. Hosea chapter four, beginning in verse one. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard. It says, Listen to the word of Yahweh, O sons of Israel. For Yahweh has a case against the inhabitants of the land, because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. There's swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore, the land mourns and everyone who lives in it languishes along with the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky and also the fish of the sea are removed. Okay. The opening verses of chapter 4 is this broad, overarching case that God is bringing against the people of Israel. Um, it serves as an introduction to this immediate section, but can also really stand as a heading for the whole second section of the book, right? This is God's basic case against the people. He'll develop it and use all sorts of different word pictures to describe the depths of their depravity and their corruption and their unfaithfulness. Um, but, but this more or less paints the picture for us. Notice it begins with a call to listen or hear. That's a powerful prophetic call. Tyler talked about it in his sermon a couple weeks ago. Jesus would pick up that prophetic call when he would say, listen or hear. He who has ears, let him hear. Listen to the word of Yahweh, O sons of Israel, for Yahweh has a case against the inhabitants of the land. Later on throughout this, he'll single out the priests. He'll single out false prophets. He'll single out their leaders, um, and, and, and lay out his indictments against different groups of people. But here it's the people in general, the, the inhabitants of the land. Notice the, the end of verse 1. What is the fundamental charge against them? What, is, what, what are they doing wrong? What have they got wrong? There is no faithfulness, no kindness. That's that Hebrew word has said, which is Loving, it's often translated loving kindness or steadfast love. There's no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. Okay? No faithfulness. Think about that in light of this Hosea Gomer picture, right? You, you, you expect a, hu- a husband to be faithful to his wife and a wife to be faithful to her husband. Yet the people of God have no faithfulness, no loyalty. No, no steadfastness in the relationship. There's no kindness, no, no, no love, and there's no knowledge of God, right? Again, think about that idea in the context of Hosea and Gomer. A husband knows his wife, and a wife knows her husband, right? That's a, that's a picture of intimacy in, in the marriage relationship, of closeness, of a physical union, but a, but a deeper union, right? And again, the people of God don't know him. We've seen this, this idea already. T- take a look at the first three chapters, and, and we'll just point out a few times where this idea of knowing God um, comes into play. If you look at, at uh, chapter 2 and verse 8, there, there, um, it, it, the, the, the woman in this case is... Um, looking at all the blessings and looking at her lovers as the source of her blessings. But look at verse 8. She does not know that it was I who gave her these things. And then look on down in verse 13. The days of her bales when she'd offer these sacrifices and follow her lovers so that she forgot me. So she did not know. She forgot. Um, Then look at verse 16. The idea that you'll no longer call me Ishi, or you will call me Ishi, no longer call me Bailey. Uh, You'll call me husband rather than master. But then look at 2 and verse 20. I'll betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know Yahweh. Down in verse 23, you are my people. They will say, you are my God. And then 3 and verse 5, they'll return and seek 
God. So this idea of knowing him, of seeking him, of relationship with him. And so God's fundamental case against his people, no faithfulness, no kindness, and deep below all that is they just don't know God. Now he'll itemize their specific crimes in verse 2. Swearing, um, that's like with the Ten Commandments, you shall not bear false witness, right? Uh, or, or, uh, and then deception, um, uh, murder, stealing, adultery, violence, um, and then the land mourns. And so notice the progression. It begins in verse 2, their fundamental failure against God. But notice how that's manifested in crimes against people, right? Crimes of injustice, Again, stealing, deception, swearing, murder, adultery, these, these, this failure to love neighbor, right? Notice that pattern, the fundamental uh, transgression against God manifests itself in their crimes against fellow human beings. Same thing we talked about in the sermon on Sunday that Jesus wants to point out to us that the, just as the, the, the fundamental way in which we express our love to God is through love for others, so a fundamental crime against God is crimes against others or failure to love others. And then zoom in on verse 3. And notice the effects or the consequences of Israel's sin. So it begins with this, this fundamental failure to know God, manifests itself in the way they treat one another, and the effect is on the land, the environment itself. The land mourns. Everyone who lives in it languishes, the beasts, the birds, the fish. Step back and see this in the context of Genesis 1. Again, what was that calling of humanity from the beginning? God appointed humanity to rule over the land, the, the earth, and to rule over the living creatures that he made, the, the beasts of the field, the wild beasts, the, the um, birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea. And notice that rulership here, because of their fail, failure, the consequences are on the realm that God has given humanity authority to rule over. And so you see this undoing of creation or this, this sort of consequence from, from failed vocation throughout creation. The last thing that I'll, that I'll just mention while we're here, um, think a little bit about um, this idea of knowing God and connecting it to their failure, right? So he lists, you know, swearing, deception, murder, stealing, adultery. And we, we notice, okay, those are specifically against other people. Um, but, but even think about sometimes how, how we can kind of talk about sin as just a, a violation of a command, all right? The command is this, command is this, and sin is a failure of a command. Well, biblically, sin is more fundamentally a failure of vocation than it is a command, but it's even deeper than that here. Notice the sin is, is manifested in, in the fact that they don't know God. It's not just that they didn't know the rules. Their, their failure to follow the rules, to obey the commands, to live a certain kind of life is a, is a revelation that they don't know God. Um, it's not just that this or so-and-so um, decided to go back to alcohol. It was that, man, they don't know God. It's not that this person decided to give themselves over to sexual desire and sensuality. It's that these people don't know God, right? And so see, that is the fundamental case against the people. Well, in verse 4, we go from general to specific. So that's the case against the people as a whole. In verse 4, he begins to narrow in on the priests specifically. Yet let no one find fault. Let none offer reproof for your people are like those who contend with the priests. So you will stumble by day and the prophet also will stumble with you by night and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you've rejected knowledge I also will reject you from being my priests. Since you've forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. The more they multiplied, the more they sinned against me. I'll change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people and direct their desire toward their iniquity. 
It will be like people, like priests, so I'll punish them for their ways, repay them for their deeds. They will eat but not have enough. They will play the harlot but not increase because they have stopped giving heed to Yahweh. So think about the role of the priest for just a minute. On one hand, we know the nation as a whole was called to be a a royal priesthood among all the nations of the earth. What did that mean? One, that they were, they were to be the, the mediators between God and the other nations, right? On one hand, they would represent God to the nations, right? They would show the world and teach the world by their life and by their carrying out the law, who God is, what he's about, what it is to love God, what it is to love neighbor, what it is to do true worship, what it is to do justice. So they would have that mediating Uh, representative role towards the other nations and yet on on the other hand they would they would represent the nations to god well that's priesthood in a broad sense the 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 priests of israel had that same kind of mediating role for the whole nation the priests were to to mediate the presence of god to the people and the people's petitions and and problems to god and specifically in the role of sacrifice Um, They would take the sacrifices before God. But there was another role that the priests had. They were also to be teachers of the law. And that was actually a, a, you know, we we think of sacrifice as a a, uh, predominant function, but teaching was right up there as as an important role that the priests had. They were the ones that would, again, read the scriptures and instruct the scriptures and 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 so it's they're the ones that are revealing who god is to the people and revealing his will but notice verse six my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge right the teachers haven't been doing their job they, they've not been teaching the people in the ways of god they they because the priests have rejected that knowledge there's a there's a intentional turning from truth from scripture from torah from god himself and then a failure to impart that knowledge to the people notice god then says i'll reject you from being my priest you've forgotten the law i'll forget you i'll forget your children well then in verse 11 harlotry wine new wine take away the understanding my people consult their wooden idol their diviner's wand informs them for a spirit of harlotry has led them astray, and they've played the harlot from God, right? Notice that language of a spirit of harlotry. It's as if they're just captivated by this, this force, this desire that's leading them in unfaithfulness away from God. They offer sacrifices on the tops of the mountains, burn incense on the hills, under oak, poplar, terebinth, because their shade is pleasant. Therefore, your daughters play the harlot, your brides commit adultery. But look at the end of verse 14. So the people without understanding are ruined. Notice how it keeps coming back to that fundamental point. It's, it's more than just this single wrong act or this single wrong act or this violation of a command. Again, it's that deeper failure to understand and to know God's will and to know God himself. All right, let's go on to, to chapter 5. Again, tonight, wanna, we're, because this is a much longer section, I want to just zoom in on a few key, key sections. Go ahead and look at chapter 5 and verse 4. It says, Their deeds will not allow them to return to God, for a spirit of harlotry is within them, and they do not know Yahweh. Moreover, the pride of Israel testifies against him, And Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Judah has also stumbled with them. They'll go with their flocks and herds to seek Yahweh, but they will not find him. He has withdrawn from them. They've dealt treacherously against Yahweh. They've borne illegitimate children. Now the new moon will devour them with their land. Notice verse 4. That's a dark and oblique state to find yourself in. Their deeds will not allow them to return to God, right? They've become so, this, this sinful behavior, this way of life has become so ingrained, so um, ingrained in their own and, 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 and habituated, right, that it's preventing them from turning. 
Why? Notice again that same picture we saw back in chapter, uh, chapter 4. That spirit of harlotry is within them. That, that concept is really important because, um, especially as we think about the promises of God's spirit, um, you'll see this kind of imagery used throughout the law, and the pro- particularly the prophets, where you'll see our, our, our lives described as, as, a certain, as being led by a certain spirit. Here it's a spirit of harlotry that's leading the people. God wants his own spirit to dwell within us. That's sort of changing the subject from Hosea a minute, but it just maybe flag that in your mind for, for your own studies through the Holy Spirit. Um, but again, their deeds will not allow them to return to God. The spirit of harlotry is within them, and they do not know. They do not know Yahweh. You see pride in verse 5. Look at this in verse 6. Can you Picture this scene. They will go with their flocks and their herds to seek Yahweh they'll not find him because he's withdrawn with them. So the the scene is they're still going to their sacred spaces for sacrifices, thinking, okay, we're going to seek God. They're living this corrupt life as as we saw in chapter 4, right, with the swearing and the deception and the um, violence and murder and adultery and stealing and all this, this injustice that's just so pervasive. Yet, notice what they're doing. They're still sacrificing, thinking they can just appease God, that they can, you know, that that's what's required uh, to ensure his favor. But notice, they will not find him, right? You come to God, bringing your sacrifices, bringing your religious service, um, that, the, the religious forms, the, the sort of rituals, and yet you won't find him. Why? He has withdrawn. Again, that's a dark and scary and bleak picture to think that God has withdrawn. Because throughout Scripture, what we constantly see is God leaning in, God reaching out, God giving us his, his, his arm, his hand, and, and asking us to take it and to, to be folded within him. And yet, enough's enough. He has withdrawn from them. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. Blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah. Sound an alarm at Beth Avon. Behind you, Benjamin, it's a call to battle there. And note, Beth Avon means house of sin, sort of a, 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 a twisting and a play on Bethel, house of house, what should be house of God. If you remember from our, you know, your studies in Kings. Um, where they would set up one of the uh, golden calves, at, one in Dan, one at Bethel. Here he's calling it house of, house of Sin. Anyway, get ready for this battle. Ephraim, Ephraim will become a desolation in the day of rebuke. Remember, Ephraim was one of the, uh, the larger tribes there in, uh, in the northern kingdom uh, where Samaria, the capital city, was located. Ephraim will become a desolation in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel, I declare what is sure. The princes of Judah have become like those who move a boundary marker. On them, I'll pour out my wrath like water. Again, that's a scary scene. I think about Isaiah 32, where God's looking ahead to the day when he'll pour out his spirit like water and pour out his blessings. Here, it's his wrath that he's pouring out on his people. And so verse 11, Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment because he was determined to follow man's command. Therefore, I'm like a moth to Ephraim and like rottenness to the house of Judah. Um, one of the things that, that's often pointed out in a Hosea study is the various metaphors that Hosea uses to describe God. The, the most predominant being that of the husband, like we saw in the, the parallel with Hosea and Gomer. Uh, other times it's a father and a son. Um, chapter 5, uh, there, there's a couple interesting uh, minor, uh, minor metaphors, but they're, they're, they give a powerful imagery. You know, thinking about God like moth, like rottenness. There is, is, is a picture of him in judgment, but in the same destruct, but, but in, in destruction. Notice this in verse 13, though. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria 
and sent to King Jareb. What's he describing in that verse? This is a picture of that sort of unholy political alliance, right? So he saw his wound. In other words, he saw his problem, which in the previous verse is described as some judgment against by from God. And so his response to it was, let's go to another nation for help, right? Um, let's, let's run to, to Assyria. But he is unable to heal you or cure you of your wound. Some problems are deeper and no, uh, in their case, military, political alliance would solve it. Things that we may run to, um, like our retirement funds or other things that we want to put our trust to, those won't fix our problems, right? Look at verse 14. I will be like a lion to Ephraim, like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear to pieces and go away. I will carry away and there'll be none to deliver. So in the previous verse, God was described as moth and rottenness. Now the metaphor of him as a lion attacking and devouring his prey. So it's a pretty intense scene uh, of God's judgment. But even scarier than that, verse 15 is his complete withdrawal. I will go away and return to my place until. So there's this glimmer of hope until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Right, so it ends with just this, well, first the, the, the statement that God is leaving and, and there's the terror of his withdrawal, right? The source of life and blessing and love and goodness in your midst, now withdrawing. That's hell, right? I will go away and I will return to my place until. And so he looks ahead to the day when they'll return, when, they'll, when his people will turn to him, acknowledge their sin, seek his face, earnestly seek him. And we get a glimpse of that in chapter 6. Look at the first three verses. Come, let us return to Yahweh. For he's torn, but he will heal. He is wounded, but he will bandage. Notice again, Assyria, false gods, whatever we want to put our trust in, that can't do it. He will heal. He will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. So let us know, let us press on to know Yahweh. His going forth is as certain as the dawn. He'll come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. Two calls in this, in this verse surrounding a promise. The first, come let us return to Yahweh. Verse 3, let us know, let us press on to know. Let's turn from our idolatry, from our whoring, from our prostitution. Turn to God. And when he does, what, what will he do? You see this work of revival, of restoration, of healing. Some of that language may have jumped off the page. You listen to the beginning of verse 2 again. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day. That's strong resurrection language. Now, again, we've talked a little bit about in our, in our Revelation study the, the way biblical prophecy works. This is not just a specific pre, uh, prediction of Jesus' resurrection. This, this was more of that pattern of fulfillment, right? Where here, in the immediate context, Hosea is clearly talking about a restoration of Israel and a restoration of God's people um, using resurrection language. And then Jesus would come along to bring the restoration of Israel and God's people by literally raising from the dead, right? And so you see how that would work in sort of a pattern type way. So this, this promise of revival, of resurrection, of healing. So let's know him, right? If we return to him, we'll have this refreshing. So let's press on to know him, to know God. Well, then you get this just brief, beautiful description of the God that we are seeking to know. His going forth is as certain as the dawn. If there is one thing you can count on, I mean, as far as this world is concerned is the sun will rise in the morning, right? The dawn will come. 
We count on as long as heaven and earth remain, there will be a sunrise. His going forth is that certain. He is that dependable. You can trust him. You can count on him. You can you depend on him with everything you've got. He will come to us like the rain. Okay, so moving on from his faithfulness and his dependability to his beneficial, his goodness, his effect. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth, right? Again, think about um, even this past year, right, with all the gloom of March and early April with the quarantine and, and just being in a box and it being so gray outside yet. Do you remember those just those rain showers that would come and then the sun would come out and the grass was green and the flowers would bloom and the birds would sing, right? That's the nourishment that comes from that spring rain. That is God. That's the God that we are seeking. That's the God that we seek to know. Well, the scene shifts. The oracle turns again in verse 4. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? For your loyalty is like a morning cloud, like the dew which goes away early. We saw a glimpse of repentance in those early verses, and I think probably 1 through 3 is probably the way Hosea looks ahead to future days. That's probably what that was. At least the people of Hosea's day are fickle. They'll bring their sacrifices, but it's not real repentance. He says it's like the dew. You know, it's they, you wake up in the morning and, and you walk out and the grass is really wet, but before long it's dried up and the grass is dry, right? It's that short-lived, unreliable thing. Well, that's their repentance. Therefore, I've hewn them in pieces by the prophets. I've slain them by the words of my mouth. And the judgments on you are like the light that goes forth. Why is God responding in judgment? Here's why. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Here's a, here's a theme that runs all throughout the prophets. This, this, what God really wants, right? Now, did he command sacrifice? Yes, of course. You can go back to Leviticus and, and places in Numbers and you see instructions for certain kinds of sacrifices. Um, but is that the, the, the substance of God's will? Is that what it means to serve God is just come to church and give your sacrifices? No, not, not at all. Um, see this in, in, the, in its ancient context. Um, if you if you go back and look at different ancient Near Eastern creation myths, um, one of the more famous and probably accessible ones is what's called the Epic of Gilgamesh, and and you'll read about this creation myth, and and, and basically tells the stories of the warring gods fighting and and how creation is sort of the byproduct of that war, but then it talks about the creation of humanity. And there, the humans were created as slaves for the gods, basically to give, to feed the gods through sacrifice, right? So, so humanity is simply divine, you know, slaves for gods just to feed the gods through sacrifices. And that says a lot about how ancient people viewed their relationship with the gods, right? Just to appease them so that, so that we can receive their blessing and not just fall victim to their their volatility and their wrath and all that. Just give them sacrifice, give them sacrifice, give them sacrifice. And it seems like Israel was buying into that way of approaching God, right? Through ritual, through sacrifice, through, through, you know, we would say like today, well, you know, as long as I go to church and just do a few of these things, right? That's all that God cares about. No, no, that, that's, that's a pagan view of God. How does, how does the creation story begin? God, as a great king, created humanity in his image, appointed them to rule, right? So you see humanity created with relate, for relationship with God, that they would live in fellowship with God, and vocation, that they would rule on his behalf. And that's what he's getting here. I, I, I desire loyalty, not like the dew, not like the spirit, rain cloud that just vanishes 
but loyalty, faithfulness. I want you to stick with me, not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burn off. I want, I want you to be faithful to me. I want you to know me. And again, think about how that's rooted in the opening indictment in chapter 4. There was no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God. What God wants is loyalty and the knowledge of him. All right, let's go ahead and, and jump ahead. So, so uh, pick up this pattern, right? Indictment, warning of judgment, glimpse of hope, right? And you see that here. We're back into an indictment section. I want to jump ahead to chapter 11 and, and, and see where we're going to find one of the larger glimpses of hope in Hosea. Let's pick up in chapter 11 and verse 1. When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Let, let me say a, a, a word here for just a second. So what God's doing now is he's, he's stepping back and he's looking at his people over the course of their history. And one of the things, let me, let me say this a little bit about biblical uh, reading and interpretation, especially in the prophets, because we, we live in a very individualistic culture uh, rather than a sort of, uh, 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 you know, like other cultures that are shame, honor, and that are sort of known for their collective identity. Um, the Bible a lot of times deals with people through that sort of collective identity. And so we read some of these things and think about every little individual, but, but really he's looking at his people as a whole, and he can talk about Israel, past, present, and future, as a single people, right? And that may be a little trippy for us if, if you're not familiar with seeing that in the scriptures. But so he's going to talk about Israel as a whole and look at them when they were young. Well, that's the first generation coming out of Egypt. And look at where they've gone wrong. Well, that's them throughout their history. But then he'll look ahead and see a turn. Well, it's going to be different people, but one overall people group. Okay? You're not in my presence. I can't see your body language to know if you've got a scrunch on your face to see if it doesn't make sense or to see heads nodding like, okay, that's clear. That makes sense. Um, hopefully that's, that's clear. The, the, the idea that, again, God's not just looking at the people of Israel as every single individual, but looking at the people in a collective sense, and he'll look at them past, present, and future. So that's, that's a pretty important interpretive key to be able to read the scriptures. All right, so let's, let's see that again. So when Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they called them, the more they went from them. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in my arms, but they didn't know that I healed them. I led them with cords of a man, with bonds of love, and I came to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws, and I bent down and fed them. They will not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria. He will be their king because they refuse to return. The sword will whirl against their cities and will demolish their gate bars and consume because of their counsels. So my people are bent on turning from me. Though they call, call them to the one on high, none at all exalts them. So you see this picture here. Now the metaphor shifted from God as the loving Hosea husband to God as a father. He looks at his, his, his son, calling him out of Egypt, right? When they were just a child, come, come out of Egypt. And he's there and he's working with them and he's, he's teaching them to walk. But rather than loving their father and serving their father and growing up to know their father, they're, they're given over to idolatry, right? And, and, and think about, I mean, it was so early in the story of Israel not just the complaining, but the idolatry with the golden calf. And then how many times throughout their history they come into the land and, and what do we see? This, this downward vicious cycle that's going on in, in judges, right? Going after the idols, going after the idols over and over and over again. And the same thing's happening um, throughout this period of the divided kingdom. But, and so then in 5 through 7, what's God saying? Exile. You're not going to go back to Egypt. You're actually going to Assyria. And so he talks about this exile that would take place. Then look at verse 8. This is remarkable. So after this 
looking at, at them in their youth, seeing where they went wrong and the, the consequences that, that will result with exile. Then he steps back and says, how can I give you up? Right? In the same way that, that, you know, we may have a child who just wrongs us and takes advantage of us and does nothing but evil, um, there would always be that, that part of us that is just so ready to love and to take back and to welcome back, just like the, prodigal, the, the father and the prodigal son, right? That's exactly what we see happening with God here. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? Do you remember the story of, of uh, uh, Abraham going ninja on the, the different kings back in Genesis 14? Adma and Zeboim were a couple of the, the um, city-states that Abraham conquered, right? Uh, wiped them out. How can I make you like that? My heart is turned over within me. All my compassions are kindled. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again. Right? So, so you see, man, God, God would punish, but, but it's that fatherly love that kicks in and just says, I just can't do it. I just won't do it. I, I, I'll, I'll welcome you back. Why not? For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst. And I will not come in wrath, right? We are the ones who are fickle. We're the ones that are volatile. We're the ones that would burst out and take vengeance. No, no, God is merciful and gracious and ready to forgive. And so he looks ahead to the day in verse 10 that they will walk after Yahweh. He'll roar like a lion. Indeed, he will roar and his sons will come trembling from the west. Notice here he's a lion again, but not to tear, but to roar and summon his people from, from all around. They'll come trembling like birds from Egypt, like doves from the land of Assyria, and I will settle them in their houses, declare the Lord. So they've gone into exile, but God will summons his people back and, and, and be in fellowship with them again. All right, so, so hopefully that gives us a sense of what's going on in this uh, section of Hosea, right? You, you see these very strong indictments. Fundamental failure is, is, is simply they do not know God, and that manifests itself in all kinds of idolatry, literal idolatry with other gods, allegiances with other nations, and then all sorts of injustice. Um, but yet God would, would be willing to forgive them and, and bring them back and restore them if they would but return. He looks at doing that on the other side of exile. What I'd like to do now is just spend a couple couple minutes before we before we close and uh, do just a, a brief step back. I, I'd like to do this with every every prophet that we look at and just ask these simple questions. One, um, let's see, let's pop up. What does Hosea reveal about God? So, so think about that for just a second. If you were to think about all that we've surveyed, what you got to read on your own, and then what we got to look at in class, what does Hosea reveal about God? There's all sorts of things, right? From the, from the micro metaphors like moth and rottenness, uh, devouring lion, to the larger metaphors of, of that Hosea, compassionate, faithful, loving husband. I'll sum it up with that, right? that God is a faithful and loving husband. Again, that's not just a trite bullet point. That means everything it means in the context of Hosea. When you think about Israel's just depraved, corrupt, whoring their unfaithfulness, right? That just lust-filled, uh, prideful unfaithfulness. When you think about that, that over against God's willingness to woo them back and to welcome them back and to continue to shower gifts and bring them to him, right? And so we are introduced and, and given a, a, a powerful vision of a God who has faithfulness and compassion and love like we can't imagine. It teaches us to start to, to really, again, see ourselves in relationship with God, um, uh, we, we think about father, son, but also husband and wife and, and, and how that metaphor helps us think about God and, and levels of knowledge and relationship and intimacy and personal connection in ways that we might not see. So there's lots of things that you, can, you could answer 
How do, what does Hosea reveal about God? That's a, a summary answer for us. What does Hosea reveal about God's will? God's will specifically for his people. What does God want from us? If you think about humanity that he's created in his image, the people that he, Israel, he bought out of Egyptian slavery and entered into covenant with, us, the people that God bought out of slavery to sin and death and Satan and brought us into covenant with him, what what, what does Hosea reveal about God's will? Again, there's lots of things that we could answer there. Just a simple summary would be, God wants us to know him, right? That, that's one of the key themes in Hosea, this idea of knowing God and God's desire that we know him. Again, just to reiterate this thing that we're seeing in Hosea, it's not about checking boxes. It's not just about keeping commands. Um, it's not even about doing this or doing that. It's fundamentally about a relationship with God. It's about knowing him. And when I know him, then I'll live a certain way, right? And a failure to live a certain way is a, re- is a revelation that I don't know God, right? And so what does God, what does Hosea reveal about God, God's will? That deep down what he wants most is that his people know him. And what does Hosea reveal about God's purpose, and, and by purpose, what, what I mean is when you look at what God is doing in the big picture of the world, right? We can think about his purpose in creation, his purpose in calling Israel, his purpose leading us to eternity. What, what, is, what does Hosea reveal about God's purpose? We won't take the time to unpack all these, but, but to answer this question, we'd really key in on all these like big picture promise statements, right? Um, and again, you can, you can um, look, point out all sorts of little details here. And I, and I would encourage you to do this, you know. Um, write down these questions and spend some time reading Hosea through these lenses. And, 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 and I'm giving only summary answers. I would encourage you, you fill, fill out this list a little bit more. But at a, at a summary level, when we look at all of those um, seven promise sections, I left one out, 10, 12 should be up there too. When you look at all these uh, promise sections, what you see is God's people will know him, right? Maybe not Hosea's generation in Israel, but someday beyond exile, the people of God will know him, right? Um, when you say it like that, you think, is that too much to ask for, right? That, that the people who are created by the creator would like their God and want to serve him and want to know him and want to be in relationship with him. And yet, that's so far from the experience, the reality of human history. And, and yet God keeps holding out. God keeps reaching out. God keeps working to woo people to himself that we could know him. And again, not just know facts about him, but know him personally, relationally, intimately, experientially. Right. Well, again, that's that's our um, overview of Hosea. Hopefully, that's that's um, again not not getting into every detail of the book by any means, but hopefully giving getting you your bearings with Hosea, helping you begin to cultivate a love for the book, uh, be less intimidated just to open it up and read it and sort of chew on it, give you some bearings to do that. So hopefully, it's been helpful and equipping in that way. Um, let's go ahead and, and um, let's, let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for um, your amazing love for us. We marvel at your faithfulness and your patience, um, how, how you, you put up with our weaknesses and uh, failures. Um, uh, we're just so thankful for your patience and your compassion, your willingness to forgive, your, your persistent willingness to forgive. And thank you for your love, for, for just for loving us so passionately, so uh, intensely. Um, we are in, in awe of you. Thank you for Hosea and what Hosea reveals about you and about a relationship with you. Um, help us never to be mechanical 
or ritualistic or rote in our, in our service of you. Help us never to become pagan, thinking we can just throw church services at you or um, singing or Lord's suppers or any of those things that have, have value and, and, and that can be formative and, and ways in which we can experience you. But help us to never reduce those to just that, that, that sort of pagan idea that we just satisfy you through those rituals. But help us to be devoted to knowing you, uh, to being faithful to you. And may that manifest in the way that we treat others through our love for, for one another, our love for our neighbor. Help us all, Lord, to grow in our knowledge of you, to grow in our love for you and grow from our love for, for, for others. That, that you would receive the honor and the glory um, that you deserve because you are so worthy. We love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.